help sick health, help epidemiology, and will help also uh, clinical uh, aspects of medicine a lot, uh, particularly whenever you live in a, a country where the population has specific culture and specific uh, sometimes uh, habits and a really uh, a specific mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, language and uh, cultural growing movement to focus on evaluating the health care uh, and uh, this evaluation is nowadays very uh, quiet we act on end results or what we call outcomes uh, outcomes can be associated with medical care delivery systems and also specific medical interventions now i'm sure majority of you who are clinicians, whenever we think about outcomes, they would think about mm -hmm. morbidity and mortality outcomes of patients. However, let me tell you that what we will talk now will try to widen this uh, perspective and we will not only be talking about morbidity and mortality, but we will be talking about lots of other important outcomes that are considered for now of highest uh, importance such as patient satisfaction, such as quality of life of patient, such as the mental aspects that can be related to treatment and even the social aspects that can be related to a treatment. So based on the definition of health, the definition that is very well known by the WHO, that health is not only the absence of a physical disease, but it's also any well-being related to physical, mental, and social well-being. So all these aspects can be considered very important whenever we are trying to assess the outcomes of a, a treatment or of any intervention in health. So uh, the objective of outcomes is really to maximize the net health benefit that can be derived from the use of finite healthcare resources. So any, any health benefit is really considered of high importance. However, you should also know that we don't have resources in health. Whenever we talk, we're talking about health, well, we are talking about finite resources. And this means that it's not only the patient aspect we should look at, but also the economical aspect that might make the uh, uh, intervention possible. Because if you look at the intervention and look at the outcome without looking at the cost of it, this might really lead to some situation where you will not be able to apply the intervention anymore. Now, uh, with this widened uh, aspect of health and of health outcomes, well, there is a serious lack of information all over the world. This is first. And second, sometimes, even if you have the intention to get the information that you need, well, you will not find adequately validated scale that can measure these outcomes. So why do we need to measure these outcomes with validated scales? Because as you know, the culture, the language, the habits, Everything that is related to a specific population, well, it might affect the way they understand a question, the way they would like to answer a question or refuse sometimes to answer specific questions. So this is why if you might find validated scales in some developed countries, for example, and you come and you want to immediately apply it to your own population, well, sometimes it will not be possible because just people will not really grasp either the importance of the question or the depths of the question. They might just understand it in an erroneous way and they might give you erroneous answer. So if you want to measure your health outcome, you should pay attention and use a really adapted scale, a scale that is adapted to your own population.
types of health outcomes that we are talking about, there are lots of health outcomes that are interesting to measure. Some people talk about the five Ds. Yes, disease. So these are two aspects that you're used to. And we also have disability, discomfort, dissatisfaction. So you can see we are more and more getting into subjective aspects of health outcomes. And whenever we talk about subjectivity and we are talking about measuring these outcomes, so we will be trying to measure subjective outcomes. And here comes the difficulty. It's easy to assess death. It's easy also to assess disease because in disease, most of the times, we have objective measures. However, assessing subjective measures is a little bit more difficult and needs a little bit more attention. And this is what we will try to do. Now, uh, some uh, sociologists uh, and uh, also some physicians try to uh, uh, suggest what we call a comprehensive conceptual framework uh, for the health outcomes. And this framework was called the ECHO model. And here they said that it's not enough to take clinical and humanistic outcomes into account, but you should also take the economic aspect into account. So clinical, well, it's easy. Everything related to medical events, to disease, to treatment, clinical practice, clinical pharmacy, simple. Economic, well, here it's the discipline of health economics and pharmacoeconomics that could interfere. Whenever we will be talking about direct, indirect, intangible costs compared with the consequences of a medical intervention. And let me tell you that there are people who are now specialized in health economics and pharmacoeconomics. So these are considered two disciplines that really uh, work a lot on health outcomes. And finally, you have everything related to humanistic outcomes, as we said, patient satisfaction, self-assessed function, self-assessed well-being. And of course, here we come to another new, relatively very important concept that is being assessed a lot this time. And this is what we call the health-related quality of life, or simply QOL, quality of life. Just a kind of review of the clinical drug development because we will need that to understand where we will need to apply health outcomes. In fact, most of you know that the phases of drug development are numerous. We have phase zero, which is the preclinical testing, lab animal studies. Uh, they are there to assess the safety, the biological activity in animals. Then you have phase one, two, and three, and these are very important phases to determine the safety, the dosage range, and also to confirm the efficacy of this uh, drug on volunteers, on patient volunteers. And after phase three, well, we reach the marketing of the drug. What happens after marketing is an additional phase four. And within this phase four, we have what we call the post-marketing testing. And here comes another discipline that is called pharmacoepidemiology. And it is during this phase where we try to really show that the drug is not only there to act on the physical aspect of health, but also on the mental and social aspect. So context is really very different from the phases one, two, three. We're not working in a clinical context anymore. We are working in an extended population that includes elderly, children, pregnant women, people with organ insufficiency, and other. So this is a real life setting, and it is here where we will start monitoring long-term 
rare side effects, we will start also to assess all the health outcomes that we've been talking about. I mean the subjective health outcomes. Now, one word about the health economics value. Why do we always need to talk about health economics whenever we're talking about the uh, uh, health outcomes? In fact, as we said, whenever we're talking about economic outcomes, we are trying to compare the cost of the different alternative treatments. And whenever we say different alternative treat, uh, treatments, it means it can be medication, it can be a surgery, it can also be a public health intervention. So anything can be compared, but the one thing that is in common with all this is we are trying to see if the cost is really worse this alternative treatment. And here I might take the example of, um, let's say, uh, some types of cancer, uh, non-curable cancers, okay? You might really pay a lot for these types. But what can you gain? Sometimes it's not possible to gain an increase in uh, long life. So what do you gain? Well, you might gain an improvement in the quality of life of patients. You might gain a decrease in the pain of patients. And it is here where you will see that you will do some kind of balance between what you're paying and what you're gaining in return. So this is why the economics is a really important issue to take into account. And most of the time, we will take the economic aspect in addition to the humanistic aspect and the clinical aspect. And there are many methods that can be used for health economics. We can evaluate the cost of illness, the cost minimization. I will not go into the detail. Cost minimization, as its name indicates, we are trying to decrease to a minimum the cost of a disease. Cost benefit analysis, we are trying to compare the cost and the theoretical benefit. Cost effectiveness, we are trying to compare the cost and the effectiveness in real life. And here you will have some types of humanistic outcomes that would be taken into account. And finally, the ones where we really use quality of life is the cost utility analysis. So here we will try to compare cost versus what patients are declaring in terms of improvement in their quality of life. And here we will talk about quality or quality adjusted life years. So how many life of years you are gaining but adjusted for quality of life. So you can see that these are really disciplines that are very interesting, very important, particularly for patients with chronic diseases and particularly for patients where it's not possible to cure uh, their disease. However, it is possible to prolong their life and improve their quality of life as much as possible. How to assess the quality of life of people? Well, as we said, to measure subjectivity. We are trying to measure the effect of a drug or any other intervention in areas that are not covered by laboratories and by physiological measurement. So here, the outcome unit will be either a kind of scale or a score that we might use, or we might also take into account patient preference, patient satisfaction. Now, how do we define a quality of life? In fact, there is no one definition, uh, consensual definition of quality of life. It can be considered as a multidimensional concept, 
that refers to a patient total well-being, psychological, social, and physical health status. This is according to Shran and Schumacher. And mm -hmm. you might also say that it is the duration of life as modified by the impairment, the functional status, perception, social opportunities that are influenced by disease, injury, treatment, or also policy. In all cases, in all cases, we can measure several dimensions of quality of life. We can measure how physical health affects function and quality of life of patient. We can measure how psychological health affects functioning and quality of life. We can also act on social function and the role that a, a per person or a patient is playing. And we can just as well measure the perception of, of an overall well-being. So you see that it's really uh, a very complex way of measuring just one concept. And this is why there are people nowadays who are just, just specialized in measuring quality of life. This is what they do in their research. They are just doing and trying to improve the way we measure quality of life. So uh, the instrument taxonomy, how to measure quality mm -hmm. of life practically. In fact, as we said, there are several instruments that can be used. There might be used uh, instruments that we call generic, and the word generic means a general instrument that can be applied to all conditions, interventions, populations. And if such as some that you uh, apply to health profile, and there is one that is very well known, it's called the SF36. So SF36, and there is also the SF12, which is a shorter version that applies on really overall quality of life. And some people may apply these uh, uh, scales in order to measure patients' preference and to come up with some economic mm -hmm. aspects, such as what we call the quality, the quality adjusted life year. There are also some specific instruments that we might use. For example, there are some instruments used only for some types of diseases. For example, to asthma or to diabetes. We're trying to assess the effect of asthma on quality of life of patients, the effect of diabetes on quality of life. We might also use some scales that uh, are really specifically designed for some specific populations. For example, elderly, for example, children, because you know you don't ask the same questions even if you're talking about the same concept, you don't ask the same question in the same way to children or to elderly or to normal adults. Uh, you might uh, try to assess some function, such as sexual, social, or other functions. And you might fi finally assess some condition or specific problem, such as pain, uh, personal satisfaction, and other conditions. So you can see that it's not a one just one concept. It's, it is a complex uh, concept with several aspects that we might try to grasp. It is not always simple to grasp this concept. Definitely we will not grasp it, uh, grasp it with just one or two questions. For example, mm -hmm. I will not assess depression just by asking the patient if he's not feeling well. This is impossible. In order to assess depression, well, you will need to ask several questions. And these questions are termed items. And you will have to ask questions that are really appropriate. And testing the appropriateness of these items is called validation. So if you want to validate a scale, 
it means that you want to make sure that within your scale, you ask the right questions and you will be able to measure the right concept with these questions. So this is why it is sometimes considered as a, a somehow complex issue because you will try to see if you can trust your scale. So it's a matter of confidence. It's a matter of trust because, as we said, it is not an objective measure. It is a subjective measure and you want to trust it. So, as we said, in order to trust this measure, we have to look at its properties. And looking at the properties, well, this is also a, a, a sub-discipline, let us call it, that is called the psychometrics. In fact, the psychometrics will try to measure psychological constructs such as quality of life. And any instrument that you will develop, well, you will need it using psychometric mm -hmm. properties in order to be sure that you will have confidence in this measurement. So, to do this kind of psychometric testing, in fact, first, you will have to measure validity, and then you will go to reliability. Sometimes you do both. Now, a test is considered valid, or a scale is considered valid, if it is really measuring what it says it is measuring, or what it is supposed to measure. Example, I want to measure the quality of life related to asthma. So validity is whenever I try to make sure that I am really measuring quality of life related to asthma and not something else. Now, ability, it's whenever you will try to assess if your test is self-consistent. In other words, I say that if your test with repeated measures will give you the same or at least similar answers. Whether it's the same patient for which you do two measurements or whether there are two different persons who are administering the questionnaire or the scale to one patient and you should obtain similar uh, uh, results. And this is called reliability. Reliability, it's the ability of a test to really give you reproducible results the same results as if you're trying to reproduce on a photocopy machine. So this is reliability. And if you look at the uh, lower part of the, of the slide, you can see that at the extreme left, we have a measure that is reliable, but it's not valid. It is reliable because you're having very close answers. However, it is not valid because you're missing the point. You're missing the, your target. The second one is low validity and low reliability. So still we're missing the point and we don't have a good reliability because the values are very far away one from the other. The third one, it's not reliable and it's not valid. So it's really the worst type of scale that you can have. And here, it's the extreme right, it's the best one. It's reliable because the values are very close and it is valid because you reach your target. You are really measuring what you want to measure. So whenever you assess a scale, a new scale that you are uh, generating or a scale that some people are using in other countries and you want to make sure that in your own country you will be able to use it, you should demonstrate both validity and reliability.
Now, I guess this is the difficult slide that I will show you because here there are too many details that are related to reliability and validity. Well, let me tell you that for reliability, there are several ways of testing reliability. We have internal consistency that we uh, use with Cronback Alpha. We have inter-rater and intra-rater test retest reliability. So we will try to repeat the test several times and see how it varies. And we don't want it to vary a lot. We want it to be more or less constant, constant between people and constant among the same people. So this is what you call the external validity or reliability, exactly the same. And then we have the internal validity. And here, the issue is a little bit more complex. So what do we have in this internal validity concept? We have the content validity, the face validity, the structural validity, the construct validity, and the criterion validity. So you can see that for every point, there will be specific measures that we will need to conduct in order for us to prove that, well, this new concept has all the validity aspects that are necessary. In addition to these, now I will show you some example and, and you will understand much better, of course. In addition to these, we will try to see if our uh, scale will respond to clinical change, and it should be so. So any change in the clinical aspect of the disease should reflect by a change at the level of the scale. It should be an interpretable scale. So I should be able to find a threshold in order to cut off the scale and say, well, people ha that have a value above this threshold, they have the problem that I'm talking about and people below the threshold, well, they don't have the problem. I should also look at the cost, the cost to the respondents in terms of time. Of course, uh, having a shorter scale is considered really a, a benefit because a very long scale, well, people might not want to just answer it. Like in any questionnaire, you always try to grasp the maximum using a short questionnaire. Uh, the cost in terms of time, in terms of administration, in terms of energy. Of course, if you want a, an interviewer to do the interview, having a scale of five minutes is not like having a scale of 30 minutes, and it's not like having a scale of one hour. Now, of course, we always prefer very short scale, as we said, particularly if we don't want to have interviews, if we want them or we want people to self assess their own situation. And now I can give you the example of the, the COVID situation. In the COVID situation, well, what is being uh, done for almost all over the world is online kinds of surveys and online studies. And uh, people are answering by themselves. So if you send them a questionnaire that is too long, well, they will just not answer or just stop in the middle of it. So this is why you should take time and you should take the duration into account. You also try to look at the alternative forms equivalence. Is a scale that can be administered using an interview, is it the same that you can administer as a self-administered form? Or is it also the same that can be done over the phone, for example? All these forms should theoretically be equivalent, and it would be a great uh, uh, issue or a great uh, thing if you can have equivalent forms. And finally, cultural and the linguistic adaptation. Of course, this is particularly important whenever you're doing international studies. You want to compare different countries with different cultures and different 
languages. So here you should pay attention that the scale that you're using is really equivalent and is really measuring the same aspects in this situation. This discipline can be now used to develop all kinds of scales, whether looking psychology, physiology, screening. And let me tell you, we are now also using the psychometric properties in order to measure some diagnosis for diseases and also the health outcomes. Now, of course, the health outcomes, we said that we invented or we created the discipline based on health outcomes, but you should know that now even some physical measures mm -hmm. can be uh, uh, measured using these techniques. Now, I would like to give you an example. Uh, this is an example that we did. Uh, it was uh, about constructing and validating the BDS-22. What is the BDS-22? It's called the Beirut Distress Scale 22. And most of the times, so whenever you have a number within the name of a scale, it indicates the number of questions that are uh, used for the scale. So this means that this is a screening tool for psychological distress and we developed the scale in Beirut this is why we called it BDS 22 you can call it whatever you can call it uh, based on your uh, name based on your mother's name it, it's up to you to decide what you want to call it however you should give it name because you are the ones who generated the scale so you should give it a name now what to measure in such a scale, as we said, looking at the validity. So how to measure validity? Several of validity can be measured. And here, what I'm showing you is a table showing the structural validity. So what is the structural validity? It's a way of analyzing the data that you obtain using all the items, if you look at the extreme left, you will see the items that are used for the scale. For example, I feel despaired. I think life has no meaning. I'm empty. I feel on the edge. I don't recognize myself and so on and so forth. All the questions that you can ask people and you're trying to grasp the concept that is here, psychological distress. The technique that we used was analysis and whenever you do a factor analysis you will try to group the items into homogeneous groups and these homogeneous groups well you will try to give them a name for example the first six items of the factor one well these are factors that are related to depression it's not a major depression. It's just depressive items that are within the distress scales. And so on and so forth. For every group of items, you will try to see what is their meaning and how you want to call them. For example, the factor two, the desire to learn, lack enthusiasm, don't know what I want, and my ideas are puzzled. So here, more or less, you have some lack of enthusiasm, lack of uh, willingness to, to live. Then you have the difficulty to relax. Well, these are what we call psychosomatic aspects of stress, and so on and so forth. So you do your factor analysis, the, uh, the, just the software will group the item for you and you will just try to find the best meaning for this uh, these groups of items that are called factors or some some people call them the components so this is a structural validity then you will have to measure the reliability there are several types of reliability here we chose the two most important ones 
The first one is called the Cronbach Alpha. And here we include the different items for every factor. And we see whether they are really linked with, the, with each other. And we will obtain a coefficient. Here we obtain, for example, for depressive items, 0 0.83, 0 0.84. For demotivation, we had 0.75. For psychosomatization, 0.71, and so on and so forth. Now, the closer it is to one, the better it is. And what we also did was do a test, retest reliability. It means that we administered the test or the scale twice to the same people, and we saw whether there is an association or a correlation between the first and the second measurement. The construct validity, here it's whenever you will try to see how the factors of your scale correlate with each other, and you will try to demonstrate that there is an association between your factors and also the other uh, scales or other possible uh, scales that could be measuring something similar to yours. For example, uh, some scales related to depression, some scale related to well-being, and here you should have negative results, and so on and so forth. This validity, here it's whenever you're trying to show that your scale, whenever it is compared between groups that are known to differ in their distress measurement, for example, well, they were really different between these two groups. And finally, the criterion validity, and this is a very, very important type of validity, Sometimes we can demonstrate it, sometimes, unfortunately, it is not possible uh, because it is the way you demonstrate that your scale, well, it correlates very well with the gold standard with which you can really correlate. So, here we are trying to demonstrate that the distress, the psychological distress, is related to the DSM, it means the clinical diagnosis of generalized anxiety mm -hmm. disorder. So what we did was to take a sample of people from psychiatrist clinic, and we know, we asked the physician, the psychiatrist, of course, to do the uh, uh, the diagnosis according to the DSM criteria. And then we gave them the scale and we measured what happened. And we saw that people who have a correct or a, an official diagnosis of anxiety, well, they have values on the scale that we generated that are a lot higher. So this can tell us that, well, our scale is able to screen and to differentiate between people who would really be sick. They have a disease that is general anxiety disorder versus people who are functional and who don't have any diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. And my uh, final uh, idea is mm -hmm. about uh, uh, my colleagues, because uh, it's been around uh, 20 years that I've been working. Uh, I have uh, a, a team of researchers. We work together, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to, to do the same with the team of the University of Nicosia, of course. Uh, my team in Lebanon is Inspect LB, so we are around 25 people. And we've been working for several years together. Uh, and what we did was to try to validate lots of scales in physical, mental health, 
lifestyles, behavior, and also some related to health professions. Uh, for physical health, we have lots of uh, skills related to asthma, to COPD, related to cardiovascular disease, and things like that. For mental health, lots of skills related to depression, anxiety, insomnia, and others. Lifestyle and behavior, mm -hmm. smoking, alcohol, uh, drug abuse, and uh, stuff like that. And finally, for health profession, some skills that uh, are really useful for physicians or for pharmacists to measure some aspects of their professional practice. It is a table of some examples. I will not really go into all the details, just that we have published the majority of the scale that we, uh, we did. For example, we developed a, a risk of stroke score, a score, and this is a very interesting one, it's called ROS, a diagnosis score for stroke, DS stroke, pedi mini pediatric asthma quality of life, MPAQLQ. Uh, now, geriatric depression scale 30. This is a scale that already exists, but what we did is to try to do the cultural validation within our population. Uh, we have the IPAC. I think you all know the IPAC, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. So it was in English. We brought it, we, of course, translated, and we uh, validated it. Uh, patient pharmacist relationship measurement, well, we did it from scratch. Uh, generalized anxiety scale, from, uh, we did a cross-cultural validation. Uh, GDS, general, geriatric depression scale, this is a cross-cultural validation. Uh, screening scale for cardiovascular disease. This is from scratch. Um, RIP scale. This is a cross-cultural validation. DSCOPD. It's a diagnosis scale for COPD. This was a, uh, developed from scratch, and so on and so forth. There are there are too many uh, to be listed here. I just listed the most important ones, and this is the BDS 22 that I uh, gave you as an example. And I would like to thank you all. Thank you for all your attention. And uh, I, if you have any questions, of course, I'm ready to, to answer.